battle for the buffalo. Save the buffalo. That was a rallying cry decades ago for many Arkansans who did not want to see the government come in and encroach on their land. These Arkansans simply wanted to keep the river the way it had always been. And in 1972, a bill was signed into law doing just that. And it made the buffalo the first national river. So what does a buffalo mean to people here in Arkansas? Why is it so sacred? Here to help put it in perspective for us and help us understand the history of the buffalo and the culture, the way of life that was saved, is U of A journalism professor and Emmy award-winning documentary filmmaker, Larry Foley. Professor Foley, thank you so much for being with us here in the studio today. Um, for those of our um, viewers who may not be familiar with you and your work, tell us a little bit about yourself. You are your former chair of the right. University of Arkansas right. Journalism Department. Nine years, which was plenty. <laughs> I'm sure the people who were there would love to have you still there as chair. Oh, I don't know, Jenny Lauren. I think so. Uh, you know, I'm a, um, I'm an Arkansan, uh, not by birth, but by choice. Uh, I didn't move to Arkansas until I was six months old because my dad was in the Air Force and I was born on an Air Force base, but my my parents were Arkansans and all of my grandparents. So I'm a um, I'm an Arkansan. Uh, basically, I tell stories about Arkansas. I consider myself a reporter of history. I was once a, a legitimate reporter in mainstream news. I've been a journalist for... Um, 49 years, if I count my time at the University of Arkansas, yeah. when I started as a as a student journalist, and I've I've long taught it and uh, practiced it, and and I still am. I just tell stories about um, about Arkansas's cultural and sometimes natural history. Tell us about a few of those documentaries that you have worked on specifically, and then I want to hone in on the one that brought you here today, which is the Buffalo right. Flows. Well, certainly the Buffalo Flows. Um, I tell people that I'd worked uh, a big hunk of my career and finally had a hit uh, <laughs> because that one um, kind of exploded and taught me a lot, uh, especially about how people feel about the Buffalo. Yeah. But I've done films like The First Boys of Spring, which is a story of the birth of baseball in um, in Hot Springs. Uh, my more recent film was um, If This Walk Could Talk about the university's 150 years and that... Um, you know, senior walk. Mm -hmm. uh, I did Indians, Outlaws, Marshals, and the Hanging Judge about the the Wild West days on the the border town of Fort Smith. And I've I've I have a, a large body of of work, um, and my my pieces are out on streaming um, venues like Tubi and Amazon Prime, and um, you know places like that. So um, and I'm I'm still out there work. I'm working on a film now about how the uh, Tawny Town Italians, how and why the Tawny Town Italians got to Tawny Town. Okay. It's called Cries from the Cotton Field that begins in Italy, goes to Southeast Arkansas, mm -hmm. and, and ends up in Northwest Arkansas. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, it's a fun story. And um, I tell people it's a story of um, faith, hardship, and resilience. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the Buffalo River um, in 2008. I believe that documentary right. premiered. Uh, called the Buffalo Flows. Right. How did that documentary even come about to where you were able to tell that story? A lot of the stories that I work on, I work on stories in a couple of different ways. Sometimes what comes through the door, people want me to do something. Uh, and then there are stories that I have just been thinking about for a while. Um, and this was one of them. My first trip to the Buffalo was with my family on a camping trip in the 60s when it was a state park. And um and our neighbors uh, had gone over there and had come back and told us about it. And, and we went over there. And then certainly when I was in college, I, um, I went on camping trips and throughout my um, uh, younger days as a, as a younger dad would take my kids floating and camping. And um, I set out to do uh, an, uh, three films that I felt like were Arkansas based stories, but were really national stories. Mm -hmm. The Buffalo Flows was the first of those, then came baseball, then Judge Parker. Um, and the title is because the Buffalo does flow. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a long effort during the great dam building era of America that grew out of the New Deal to, to place not one, but two dams on that river, like they did on the White. Mm -hmm. You know, there are dams all over that White River. 
uh, there are places where you can go and you think, oh, that looks, those bluffs look like the buffalo. Yeah. But they also became a big giant series of impoundments. But it's a story that I, I wanted to do. Uh, and like I was telling you earlier, uh, I remember we released that film 15 years ago this month mm. at the Hot Springs Documentary Film Festival. Standing room only crowd. Uh, the next week we had a screening set up on campus and they had to turn people away. And I thought, what is going on? Yeah. And um, because it was just another film that I'd done, one that I wanted to do. And that taught me a lot about how people in Arkansas feel about their river. You know, it, it kills me when I, I see like Miss America and they talk about the diamond state. Well, it's like, have you ever been down there to Murfreesboro? It's like mm -hmm. a patch of dirt. <laughs> where they give you a shovel and a bucket yeah. and, and you know, not if there's anything wrong with that, yeah. but the Buffalo, yeah. it, people feel passionate about that. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why we have a free flowing stream today. And we don't have two lakes over there in North central Arkansas. Talk to us. You spent several years researching and right. working on this film right. before you even premiered it in 2008. Talk to us about that process what did you learn? What surprised you? The stories that you were able to pull out of people um, from that community? Well, the one thing that I, I didn't want to make the film entirely about the fight to save the buffalo. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's part of the story. But I really also wanted to talk about, Jenny Lauren, about what was it that we saved? Yeah. You know, what happened when we didn't drown that those valleys with uh, reservoirs? Yeah. Uh, we saved the culture of Boxley Valley, you know, and we tell the story of Boxley Valley Baptist Church. And we've got a sweet little story about people being baptized. Yeah. We talk about the, the wildlife and the elk and the buffalo and, and uh, things that are there because the river wasn't drowned. Um, the lead story, the lead sentence, uh, and I'll tell you how I got it the Buffalo River begins and ends in a wilderness. A lot of the area around the Buffalo is in wilderness. That's a lot of what we saved. Yeah. Um, my dear friend, Kim Smith, was a, uh, a biologist, uh, passed away a few years ago, um, sadly. And uh, he gave me that line over coffee one day. Mm. He said, you know, Larry, the Buffalo begins and ends in a wilderness. And I thought, that there's, that's my lead. Yeah. Um, it was narrated by Ray McKinnon, an accomplished actor, an Academy Award winning filmmaker uh, who has this. Uh, he, I always say he sounds like Sargon Molasses. And yeah. I wanted that folksy delivery. And uh, pretty much everybody in it is is um, an Arkansan. Yeah. I remember uh, when I interviewed Richard Davies and he had just left as head of parks and tourism. And, and he was talking about the buffalo, and he said, you know, people get really emotional when you start trying to do something different with that place where we'd all gone mm -hmm. and fished and floated and camped. And, um, and there are certainly some heroes to this story, at times some unlikely heroes. Talk to us about that. Yeah. As I, I went back to watch The Buffalo Flows, it had been, it had been a you. few years since I watched it, and... Um, the way that you um, laid out the story and the timeline right. and the history of it, but then moving so beautifully to where we are now, right. but go back to, I believe that was around the seventies or the sixties when um, uh, with, you know, them wanting to have uh, the, the dam built and just the fight, those people who got involved, as you mentioned, unlikely right. characters. Some of them were, um, it's a, I think it's a fascinating story. Uh, Neil Compton was the Benton County, Bentonville doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, one of his float, he, he first began floating the Buffalo in a John boat when he was in college. I believe it was in the thirties. It was way back. He was just an, an Ozark stream. And, and over the years, he and Sam Walton would float that river together. Mm -hmm. um, but there was also a group out of, um, out of Kansas city uh, and Margaret and Harold Hedges were among that group and they would come down here and float and camp and they really started it all and then they knew about Neil Compton. Neil would Neil 
outside of being a doctor, he delivered pretty much every baby, you know, <laughs> in, in the Bentonville yeah. area probably for 40 years. Um, he was also a photographer and a filmmaker. Mm. And he would make these films. Uh, they were amateur films. Uh, and he would narrate them self, himself. Uh, and I got a hold of his old films and he would show them to ladies garden clubs yeah. around the state. And he just, as, as, as Ellen, his late daughter told me, he was just relentless, you know, with telling people we don't need another dam. Now, how did the dams come about? Well, you need to think about the Tennessee Valley Authority mm -hmm. and the, and FDR's new deal. And, uh, you know, there were all kinds of entities involved in that. But one of them was it was a great dam building era pushed by um, FDR, New Deal uh, mm -hmm. Democrats. And we think about our area. You know, we have Beaver and Norfolk and Bull Shoals and Beaver. These are all dams on, yeah. you know, on the White River. That's why we don't have the White River that it right. looked like. Now, the dams are great. But the the push was we got enough dams. Mm -hmm. We need to leave this river alone. Yeah. And um, Neil fought and fought, and and so did the hedges and that Ozarks uh, Waterways Society, I believe was its name. And um, and they got the attention of the people, and they got the attention of legislative leaders. So we flash forward to 1971. And a young congressman from uh, uh, Harrison, John Paul Hammerschmidt, a re traditional Republican, and a, a liberal Democratic senator, uh, J. William Fulbright, introduced bills in the House and in the Senate. And, um, and the bill was signed into law by Richard Nixon in 1972, 51 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, let me back up from that because I, I think it's it's. Uh, kind of an interesting story. What really turned the tide uh, with the Corps of Engineers backing off on building not one but two dams, one was around Buffalo Point, the other was up um, closer to, um, you know, the northern end of the river, is that Orville Faubus, who was a, an, Ar an Ozarkian, who was a populist Democrat, populist Democrat, um, Agree with Faubus or not, he would read the Populist Tea League, and it became obvious to him that this is not politically smart. Yeah, uh, and I'm adding my own opinion know, here. Yeah. This is my interpretation right. of it because he was a populist, yeah. and um, and he wrote a passionate letter that we included in the film mm -hmm. to the Corps of Engineers that said, uh, "We don't need to dam this river. You got enough dams." Yeah. The Corps would not go against the seated government. And that stopped it. But it was a number of years before those bills, uh, Jenny Lauren, were introduced in the Congress. So I tell people, two heroes of the Buffalo River story, Orville Faubus and Richard Nixon. Go figure. <laughs> exactly. Well, <laughs> I went back and I pulled that out about Faubus. And yeah. what he put in the letter, he said, quote, one of the greatest examples of the majesty of God's creation. Beautiful. And he said building a dam was unacceptable and unnecessary. How can you, you know, we quoted that. It's yeah. beautiful. Beautifully it's said, beautifully written. Um, you know, it just goes to show that that no one person is one thing. Right. You That's know. so true. Yeah. Well, and I think what's interesting, if we... In, not to fast forward too much, but there's so much conversation right now, again, right. about the Buffalo. And what I think is really fascinating to watch is kind of like what we saw during the special session with the Freedom of Information Act. Right. You saw people from the entire political spectrum, opposite ends of the aisle, come together um, on the same page. Not to not to water down FOI. Not to water down FOIA. Which honestly surprised me. I told you that I was surprised when people just started packing these screenings of the Buffalo Bluffs. I was. Yeah. But then, you know, it's it's hard to put a finger mm -hmm. on what people will be passionate about. I think what was going on with that, in, in my thought, is that we don't want the government working in secret. Right. We want to know what's going on. If you don't have anything to hide, then don't act like you're hiding something. You know what I mean? And I think what's going on, I really don't know, and I don't, what's going on with the Buffalo National River and these 
this conversation about maybe changing its status uh, and would that um, create more um, pressure on the natural stream? I don't know where that's coming from. I don't know what's going on, but I will tell you as a journalist, lifetime journalist, practitioner and teacher, um, I'm always um, alerted to, well, if nothing's going on, why don't we know about it? You know, tell us what's going on and maybe it's okay. Yeah. Maybe it's fine, but I don't know. And I don't think we ought to be working in secret about it. Let's just tell people, you know, what Neil Compton did was he let people know. Yeah. He let people know what big government, you know, the interesting thing about Neil very conservative. And you might think, well, what's he doing? Very conservative. What's he doing leading a, 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 a fight to preserve nature? That sounds kind of liberal. <laughs> well, not really. Yeah, He's fighting big government. Uh, Neil Compton was small town doctor from little town, Arkansas, Bentonville. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. um, Ellen, his daughter told me that, uh, there were very few babies that he didn't deliver. You know, it was, yeah. that was what Neil Compton did. But he loved that river. He first began floating it in a John boat when he was a college student at the U of A, uh, I think in the 30s. Uh, Sam Walton would float with him. And he just did not want those dams built. He felt like they were unnecessary. Um, and the thing that Neil did is that he let people know what was going on and and he these films that he made were were just little amateur films, yeah. and he narrated them himself. Himself, I've listened to them, uh, and you could hear him. And he shot them himself. He edited them, uh, the films himself. And what he would do is that he had his little script ready, and he had his record player, and you could hear that. And he loved classical music, mm -hmm. so he would drop that needle, and you would hear it. And then the music would start. This is the beautiful Buffalo River. And that's the way he put these films together. And he he showed them to anybody, especially women's garden clubs, anybody that would want to, to hear them. And he really created a groundswell of enthusiasm. And they became a force. We don't need that dam. And that message got to the governor and they turned those dams away. Talk to us about that unlikely partnership between Neil Compton, um, Sam Walton. You mentioned that they were float buddies. They were. And just the um, the true conservative nature of what they were fighting, what they represented, what the Buffalo represented and what they were fighting against. Right. Well, once again, I consider myself a reporter of history. I'm a journalist. Uh, so... Uh, the Republican, if you were a Republican in those days in, in, in a state like Arkansas that was controlled by Democrats, uh, Dixiecrats, mm -hmm. I mean, we were part of the Old South. Um, and the, the traditional Republican philosophy in those days was less government, smaller government, less government interference, lower taxes. Yeah. You know, that was Republican conservatism four generations. Mm -hmm. uh, and that fit hand in hand with what those guys would stand for, yeah. you know, because yeah, they were going to save a natural river, but they were also fighting off big government, yeah. you know, big dam building. So I really don't think that those, those uh, ideas were um, in contradiction for, from who they were and, and what they were trying to stand for at all. Yeah. I think that if there may be some viewers who are listening now and they're hearing what they stood for then less government right. interference, uh, really protection of personal. By the property. way, I'm not making this up. This is, this is historical. Oh, and we, and I know that, but I think people now when they see almost um, whether it's a fight or not, we don't know, but we don't know. We and don't know. We don't know. We don't know what's going on because it's not out there. And if we go back to FOIA, you know, we, we know what's going on. Uh, I would say with the group that's that's investigating and exploring, I don't know that's much more than that right now from what I hear, 
exploring a, a different uh, approach to the Buffalo National River, perhaps making it a national park. I, I really don't know. Uh, at some point in time, this needs to get out about what what are the ups and downs about this? What are we really talking about? Because what I've learned about the buffalo is that people are passionate about that river. I was surprised. Don't mess with that river. And maybe they're not, Jenny Lauren. I don't know. I don't know what we're talking about here. I'm just a proponent of let's let's let people know. What are we talking about here? Not a push pole. Let's talk about what we're really trying to do. Right. Because I think, and I know I'm, you're not here to get into the, the no. political commentary, and I'm not going to ask, I'm I'm ask you to do that. But I think that's what a lot of people are having a problem with. There's so many, they can see so many dots that are connected, yeah. but yet um, we're not getting any. Let's talk about what you're really trying to do. That's right. What do you, maybe you're just exploring. Well, what are you exploring? Right. You know, if you change the status, what would it do? More stress on the river? You know, the thing that we have to understand is that that's a natural free-flowing stream, thus the name the buffalo flows. Um, all of those tributaries that flow into that river are a part of that natural ecosystem. So any stress, tourism, whatever, uh, industry, like the hog farm, mm -hmm. uh, any stress on one of those tributaries impacts that natural river and that's a part of the story i mean it's it's like the branches of a tree if you take a look at it you know all of those little streams that flow into the bigger stream that ultimately flows into the white down there on calico rock right and i think when you hear the administration say it's also about preservation well again what does that look like yeah. and are we you know would it potentially look like um we're going to restrict access and only allow people there at certain times. Are you going to restrict access? Are you going to put too much access where you have too much pressure? We don't, we don't I don't know, know what yeah. they're trying to do. Let's talk about, let's go back to how you were able to talk to some of the families and the people right. who spent their lives on the Buffalo. Um, you mentioned, and I know a few other people did, how this is an emotional and spiritual place for Very many so. people. Yeah. Talk to us. You've got people, especially around Newton County, right. Jasper, Ponca, fifth generation, sixth generation, family owned land. And okay. if you talk about conservative values, less government, no land grabs, stay away. Well, you know, part of the problem that some had with, uh, it was around Clinton, Arkansas. Uh, they wanted those dams because they felt like that was going to be a tourism boom. Uh, but what it would have done was, was swallowed those valleys up with an impoundment of water. People who have been kicked off their land. Now, to this day, people that live around Boxley Valley and Jasper, um, you know, Ponca, that area, they're not big about wanting the government to come in there and tell them what they can and cannot do with that land that may border the river. They don't like it. Yeah. They live out there in rural America for a reason. They like being out there. And it's my land. Why can't I do what I want with my land? And that is an attitude that exists out there. People were asking me when I was filming um, back years ago, well, do you still run into people that want that, that, that wish they'd had that dam? And I said, no, no, I don't ever hear that. I don't think people regret that a bit, but the locals really don't like people messing with their land. Now, you know, there are people that come in and buy up some of that land away from a lot of the locals and um, that will change the face of it because they're not just talking about raising their cattle or, you know, having yeah. a farm or just living there and maybe commuting all the way back into to Fayetteville because then they live there because they want to. That That's a completely different thing. So like a lot of stories that I work on, it's not one thing. Right. You know, there, there are a lot of things. What we did is and what I wanted to do was, you know, I interview Mike Mills, longtime outfitter. Um, I interview ecologists. But we also talk with folks who live in that valley. We went to a Boxley Valley Baptist Church, one of the most scenic places in the state of Arkansas. Uh, we interviewed Tim Ernst, you know, mm -hmm. who is a, a, a master yeah. of, of images, many of them that come from the Buffalo River area. Yeah. 
uh, one of my favorite things that we did was um, I asked the pastor there at Boxley Church, uh, well, do you do you baptize in the river? And he said, well, we do if we have people to baptize. So um, we had it all set up and we went and, and come to find out and neither church knew it. There were two churches that particular Sunday morning who were going to baptize in the river and they were singing traditional hymns and it was just the sweetest thing ever. Yeah. It was so sweet. Now, I'll, uh, can I tell you one little story that happened? We had to wait to do that because there was a group that had moved, that had not moved in there, but had had come in there and had lived up there. They were called, I, I can't remember what they were called. I shouldn't call their name anyway, but they'd been up on that river and they'd made a mess of things. Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, fecal count was high in the river and nobody wanted to be baptized. Yeah. So very quickly, you can see what external pressures can sure. do to that river in a quick order of time. They had to wait until the river cleaned its cleaned itself before people wanted to go down there and be baptized. You mentioned Mike Mills and he is is in your film and right. a lot of people will remember him as a uh, former secretary director of Parks and uh, for a short time. For a brief but he time. worked at Parks and Tourism many years before that. Yes. Um he had a beautiful quote in the film and he said that um at the Buffalo you find a peace in your soul. He said that you can only imagine that he could only imagine if he had gone to heaven. And then right. another thing that he said that I thought was really interesting about the Buffalo is he said, what makes it special for the American public is that anyone can come here and enjoy this river. You don't need a white rod or raft guide right. or a special permit. You can come set up camp on a gravel bar and you don't have to be a professional. This is no one. You don't have to have a campsite. Don't have to come. But this is no one person's river. This is, this is every Belongs to the people. That's right. Yeah. And I think that's, that's has been the concern, and I think perhaps it is the concern again, you know. For those who have not watched the documentary, um, The Buffalo Flows, tell people how they can watch it and anything else that you'd like them to know. You know, we watch so much TV these days in different ways. Yeah. We watch it on streaming. Uh, and one of my favorite ways to uh, watch streaming is on Tubi, T-U-B-I. It's free. Yeah. Um, they make money by inserting commercials, which I'm fine with that. I came out of commercial television and you can, you can watch the Buffalo flows and, and several of other, my other films, uh, for free. That's, that's how you can watch it. And it's, it's, it's great for me to know that, um, that that work 15 years ago still has, has legs. I, I, um, I've, I've been at this long enough now to hope that, you know, that my work has legs yeah. and that there's a legacy to it that um, those stories that we told are, and it was intentional, are in many ways timeless. Well, beautiful insight, beautiful documentary. Thank you so much for coming in to talk with us today. Thank you for having me.